few plants and some soil. It's a whole growing system, and that includes homemade garden structures. I'm just putting the finishing touches on this cold frame. It's just a wooden box with a hinged transparent cover. Actually, this is an old storm window sash. A cold frame is a great way to get a jump on the season, and I'm going to use it as a solar dryer, but I'll show you more about that later on. Now let's go into the garden and see some structures at work. The simplest support of all is the classic tomato steak. Most tomato varieties are indeterminate. That means they love to climb, but that can be tough to do when you're weighted down with 10 or more pounds of plump tomatoes. While the plants are still small, before their root systems have had a chance to get too widespread, get a sturdy stake at least four feet tall and drive it into the ground right next to the plant. When the plant gets big enough to need it, tie it to the stake. Now use a loose, but secure figure eight pattern like this. And never tie it tightly around the stem because remember, it's got to expand. You can stake heavily laden eggplant and peppers too. A cage is nothing more than a circular stake. You can buy them at your local garden store ready made or you can make your own. It's easy. I like to use concrete reinforcing wire for my tomato cages. It's strong. It has a large mesh that makes tending and harvesting easy, and you can make them any size you want. Here I've got pixie tomatoes. They're a determinate variety that grows on a low bush, so I only need a short cage. This cage is just two and a half feet tall, and six inches of it are in the ground, so that makes it a good solid support. A cage can also be laid down like this. I use them this way for low-growing tomatoes, like these meaty romas. After I planted, I lay them down like this, secure them with some stakes, and just let the tomatoes grow right up through it. This is a great way to grow a whole hedgerow of tomatoes. By the way, when the season's over, I just unhook my tomato cages and flatten them out for convenient winter storage. A trellis is another basic garden structure used to support climbing plants. This A-frame design is made of ordinary furring strips nailed together and costs just a couple dollars for materials. And the hinge at the top lets it fold flat for easy storage. A trellis is often used for vine crops to help them grow up in the air instead of sprawling and wasting garden space. And there's plenty of room under the trellis for a shade-loving crop like this young lettuce I just transplanted. Here's a vegetable that got its name from the way it's supported, pole beans. They have a distinctive nutty flavor and they're very productive, but they need room to climb too. This trellis is made of three sturdy poles, a top and bottom board, and a series of strings for the plants to climb. They'll wrap themselves around the string as they grow upward. You may have to guide them from time to time because they'll take any vertical support they can find. They'll even jump from string to string as they grow. A little later, I'll want to add some guy wires to this design. The heavily laden bean vines act a lot like a sail, especially when they're completely covered. I learned the hard way. I've had the poles snap right off in sudden gusts, making an awful mess in the garden. there's always the trusty pole bean teepee. A group of three or four slender poles fastened securely at the top with wire or rope. Plant five or six seeds around the base of each pole and later thin to the strongest three or four. The vines will wrap themselves tightly around the poles and climb right up. This design is very stable in windy conditions. It's attractive and it's easy to build. And like the A-frame trellis, you can plant a crop of lettuce under here. These beans won't mind a bit. Here's another support for our friend the tomato. This one resembles a horizontal ladder. 
The plants are trained up through the rungs, and then they're allowed to sprawl, but this time up off the ground. I made it like a ladder with the rungs spaced about a foot apart, added some legs, and put it in the garden. Pretty soon, I'll be harvesting lots of plump, juicy tomatoes. Stay tuned, and I'll be right back with lots more garden structures that are both attractive and functional. Homeowners, for years, the Troy Built Tiller has been America's greatest vegetable gardening machine. Now it's a whole lot more. Watch this. Use it to build beautiful flower beds. Reseed four sections of your lawn in no time at all. Prepare bedding areas for landscape shrubs or plants. Level uneven ground like this driveway. Easily make ditches for drainage or irrigation. And dig deep trenches for building or gardening projects. The Troy Built even hauls heavy loads and then spreads them without raking or shoveling. A Troy Built will not only give you the nicest, healthiest vegetable garden in the neighborhood, it will give you the best looking yard and property as well. For your free Great Gardens catalog on the complete lineup of Troy Built Tillers for small and large gardens, call toll free 1 800 453 9600. There is no obligation, so please call 1 800 453 9600 for your free Troy Built catalog today. Homeowners, introducing Troy Built's amazing Super Tomahawk Chipper Shredder. As every homeowner knows, it doesn't take long to accumulate a good-sized pile of brush, downed limbs, hedge prunings, and other materials. But once the pile's built up, you have to dispose of it. The amazing Super Tomahawk will easily turn an entire pile of brush into valuable mulch and composting material that's free for the making and ideal for smothering weeds around trees and shrubs. The Super Tomahawk will shred just about any kind of material, including brush, leaves, vines, and more. Plus, unlike ordinary shredders, the Super Tomahawk has a separate chipping blade to handle larger materials, including branches up to three inches thick. So if you want to clean up brush piles the easy way and get mountains of mulch like this, call toll-free 1-800-922-9400 for complete details on the amazing Super Tomahawk from Troy Built. That's 1-800-922-9400. Call today. Here's a common structure that I think is the most important one you can build, a garden fence. Nothing is more frustrating than losing your harvest to the local rabbits or woodchucks. And if your neighbor's dog continues to make a shortcut through your garden, it's time for a fence. I like to use chicken wire with a one inch mesh. Make it at least three feet high and four feet is even better. It keeps out most pests, it's easy to get, and it's relatively inexpensive. Space posts eight to 10 feet apart, and be sure they're securely planted in the soil 18 inches or more. If you have a problem with burrowing animals, it's a good idea to bury a foot or so of fence to keep them from digging their way underneath. You remember that cold frame I was building earlier? I said I'd turn it into a solar dryer. Well, here it is. Use it to dehydrate fruits, vegetables, or herbs. I just added a rack covered with some fiberglass window screening. Just put the food to be dried on the rack. Now, on a warm, sunny day, this parsley will dry in just a few hours. Put a thin layer on the rack because you don't want it to bunch up or it'll dry slowly. And use small quantities. I really like dried parsley because it makes a great garnish for soups or stews or whatever you have. This cover is made out of that same fiberglass screening that the rack is. I put it over there. That keeps insects out, and it provides a good airflow. Now, I've propped the coal frame up on these bricks, and I'll crack the cover by propping it open on this block of wood. That provides a constant flow of warm air that dries everything inside really fast. Now, since the flavor and quality of most vegetables is affected by intense direct light, I've stapled some black plastic on the inside of the coal frame's cover. This provides shade, but it's easily removed if I want to turn this back into a coal frame. So far, I've shown you garden structures that support climbing plants. Well, how about those that extend the growing season? 
the French have a word for them. Cloche. That means bell jar. They used a clear, bottomless glass jar to protect plants. Today, the term refers to any device used to extend the season by protecting your plants from frost and the elements. Now, here's a special row of tomatoes I've planted to show you some of the more familiar cloches. You may recognize this one as an ordinary shopping bag. With four sticks in the corner, it just props it open. The open top doesn't provide much frost protection, but it does gather heat and protects the young plant from cool winds. Now, the next one of our homemade cloches is this plastic milk jug. Now, I've cut the bottom off and planted it firmly over this young plant. Now, it's the modern version of the original glass bell jar. It does provide frost protection, and it's got a built-in ventilation system. Normally, you can leave it open, but if cool weather threatens, just screw the cap on. You'll recognize this next one as the commercially available hot cap. Now, it does the same thing as the plastic milk jug, but it's just made of waxed paper, and it comes in several different sizes. I call this cloche my mini greenhouse because that's the way it works for my plants. It's just some plastic reinforced with chicken wire. You can shape it almost any way you want and use it over and over again all over the garden. See, I've just formed a little foot here and anchored it down with some soil. It's easy. Just like that. It's surprising that some garden supply stores don't carry it. But I'm sure if you ask them, they'll be glad to order it for you. And finally, there's this roll-top cloche. Now, that may sound complicated, but it's really simple to make. All you need is some black plastic tubing, some clear 4 mil plastic, a couple of wooden stakes, and some twine. Start by cutting the tubing into four-foot lengths and shoving it into the soil firmly over the row so it forms an arch. Now space them every couple feet down the row. Now drive your wooden stakes in the center of the rows at each end and secure the hoops by looping twine over each one. This keeps them evenly spaced and keeps them from flopping in the wind. Now just drape the plastic over the frame. Gather the ends together like closing a bag and tie them around the stakes. If you used four foot wide plastic, you'll have just enough on each side to anchor with some soil. Now here comes the roll top part. To ventilate, just roll up the sides. And if cold weather threatens, just roll them down. There you have it, from an ordinary shopping bag to a plastic tunnel. Cloches are a great way to extend your season. Here's a trellis idea that's a lot easier to make than it looks, and it's attractive enough to use by the front door. This graceful fan trellis is made by ripping ordinary spruce furring lumber into long three-quarter inch strips. You may be able to buy it already ripped. You can use redwood or pine, whatever your taste in pocketbook prefers. The strips were nailed at the bottom to a piece of one by six, about a foot long that acts as a stake, with some galvanized nails. Then a 10, 20, 30, and finally, a 48-inch spreader was added every couple feet up the trellis for strength. This 10-foot tall trellis is a great place for some morning glories like I've got here, pole beans, or even a climbing rose. Raspberries need support, too. And here's an easy way. Set sturdy posts at the end of each row. Now, if you have a long row, space the posts about 10 feet apart. You'll need two or more cross arms. The top one should be about four feet off the ground, and the bottom one, oh, 16 or 18 inches. Now, as these black raspberries grew, I discovered I needed this middle one, and I added it later. Now, drill some holes near the ends of each cross arm and stretch some smooth galvanized wire, like electric fence wire, through the holes. The wires keep the plants loosely confined and up off the ground. Plus, the supports make a great framework for this bird netting. And this time of year, I want to keep as many of these beauties for myself as I can. Don't they look great? Here's a structure that no garden should be without, a composter. Compost is the best fertilizer you can use. 
It's partially decomposed plant material from your yard and garden. Pure organic matter, or humus. It won't burn your plants like some fertilizers and manures can, yet provides plenty of nutrients to keep your plants healthy. Of course, plant material will decay where it lies, but by piling it in some sort of organizer, you encourage the development of microorganisms that hurry the process along. For starters, make a compost bin like this, using American wire, also called turkey wire. A nine-foot piece of this three-foot wire makes a bin about three feet in diameter, like a giant tomato cage. I find this is a good size for most gardeners. These pallets, rescued from the trash heap and fastened together with some garden stakes, make a great compost bunker. The open front makes handling compost materials easy. A little fancier, maybe, but still the same idea, uses chicken wire stapled to a simple frame. It's fastened at the corners with hooks and eyes, so it comes apart for turning the pile or harvesting the finished compost. Compost bins, trellises, cloches, they're all simple structures that anyone can put together, and they'll help you create your best garden ever. I hope you'll give them a try. Hi, Dave. Hi, Janet. Looks like the cucumber harvest is in full swing. What do you plan to do with those? Well, I'm going to make bread and butter pickles out of these because they're just the right size and they're fresh and tasty. Oh, they look great. Your work's cut out for you with that basketful. No, not really. I could do two or three batches today with absolutely no trouble. But don't you have to process them in hot water and that sort of thing? Oh, sure, but it's not complicated. Anyone can make great tasting pickles. Stick with me and I'll show you how. Gardeners, if you love fresh tasting vegetables and big beautiful flowers, but think results like this take too much time and too much backbreaking work, here's great news. Introducing the affordable Troy Built Junior, designed especially for smaller gardens. Just look at the time and work the Junior will save you. It's so easy to prepare perfect ready to plant seed beds. Plus, working organic matter into your soil is a snap. Spot till areas for beautiful flower gardens and borders. Why, you can even use the Junior to reseed your lawn or ring fruit trees. You'll be amazed at how much time and work the Junior will save you. So if you want to learn more about getting results like this, the fast, easy Troy Built way, call now to receive your free Troy Built catalog. For your free catalog featuring the Junior and our whole line of Troy Built tillers, including our no money down easy payment plan, call toll free 1-800-453-9600. Operators are standing by. That's 1-800-453-9600. Call now. Homeowners. Stop burning, bundling, or bagging leaves, brush, and yard debris. Now the new Troy Built Junior Tomahawk Chipper Shredder will quickly dispose of problem yard wastes. The Junior Tomahawk wheels easily to where you need it and starts with a simple pull on the rope. It easily cleans up fall leaves and quickly shreds garden residues of all kinds. It cleans up prunings from hedges and shrubs or hard-to-handle brambles and brush. The Junior Tomahawk even chips branches up to two inches thick. It quickly turns all your yard debris into fine compost-like plant food and beautiful professional quality landscaping mulch. And when work's done, Junior takes up less space than your lawnmower. Learn all about the new small property Junior Tomahawk in this free guide to chipping and shredding. Call toll-free 1-800-922-9400 now. There's no obligation and the guide is free. That number is 1-800-922-9400 for free details about the new low-cost Junior Tomahawk. Operators are standing by. These pickling cucumbers are fresh and beautiful. They're perfect for bread and butter pickles. I picked them this morning before the sun got hot enough to wilt them, and I washed them really well. You use your best cucumbers for pickling, the firm ones with no blemishes. Now, bread and butter pickles are a sweet sliced pickle, and I use my food processor for slicing because it's so much faster than doing it by hand. The first step to making bread and butter pickles is soaking the cucumbers in salt and ice. Use a big bowl to combine about six pounds of sliced cucumbers and three cups or a pound of sliced onions. This will yield about eight pints of pickles. Then I sprinkle on a third of a cup of pickling salt. I want a hint of garlic flavor, so I'll put in two whole garlic cloves. Then mix it all up well. The salt draws the moisture out of the cukes to make a nice, crisp 
pickle. Be sure to use pickling salt. Table salt has additives that will discolor the pickles. Last of all, cover the pickles with two trays of ice cubes to keep them nice and cool. Now I'll set this batch aside and let it sit for three hours. The next step is to make the pickling brine. Use a stainless steel pot and make sure it's big enough to hold all your pickles. Start with four and a half cups of white sugar. Then add one and a half teaspoons of turmeric, which is bright yellow and gives the bread and butter pickles their color. Now add a half a teaspoon of celery seed for flavor and two tablespoons of mustard seed. The mustard seed gives them a little zest and it looks nice in the pickles. Pour in three cups of cider vinegar. It has a milder flavor than distilled vinegar and it adds some color too. Stir it all up and turn on the heat. Now here's a batch of cukes and onions that sat for three hours and I rinsed them well to take the salt off them. I also removed the two cloves of garlic. And I'll just add these to my brine. I'll just scoop them all in there. There we go. Give them a good stir so that they're well coated. And then we'll cook it for five minutes. Once they're done, it's time to pack and process these pickles so they'll stay fresh and delicious. I use the hot water bath method. It's a good safe process approved by the FDA. And if you follow these steps and don't skip anything, your pickles will turn out great. Before you start, inspect your jars and throw away any that are chipped or cracked. Check your lids and ceiling rings too. Lids are not reusable. This lid was used last year. See the depression caused by the vacuum sealing? The other lid is new. It will form a good seal when I process these pickles. Sterilize the jars in one pot and the lids in another by boiling them in water for 15 minutes and leave them in the hot water until you're ready to fill each one. That way they won't pick up any airborne dust. When the pickles and brine have cooked for five minutes, ladle them into the jars using this special canning funnel and try to get mostly pickles in the jars, not mostly brine. Leave about a quarter of an inch of headroom so the pickles don't touch the lid. That way the jar will seal itself well. Then run a chopstick or a spatula around the inside of the filled jar to release any air bubbles. Wipe the rim with a clean cloth and put on the lid and the screw band and tighten it gently. I'll fill all these jars first and then I'll put them all into the canner together. Put the jars into very hot water, not boiling hot, because too much of a temperature difference can break the glass. And if they need it, add more so they're covered with at least two inches of water. And for this bread and butter pickle recipe, boil pint jars for five minutes. For quarts, boil them for 10 minutes. You start counting after the water has begun to boil. After they've been processed, set the jars on a towel and leave them for 24 hours to cool and seal. You'll be able to hear the seals forming as the jars cool. It makes a nice kerplunk sound. Before putting your jars into the storage shelves, check the seals. The top of the lid should be slightly depressed. These bread and butter pickles are just delicious. I like to give some to friends as presents, but I always keep plenty on hand for myself. Thanks, Janet. Tastes great and doesn't take a lot of time. A few rainy day projects in the workshop will let you take advantage of Mark's ideas for garden structures. So give them a try and make the most of your garden space. I'm Dave Schaefer, inviting you back again next week for more of The Joy of Gardening.